So, I just listed uh, some of the ionization curves. So, here obviously this can be replaced with energy, but then the nature of the curve will change, it will become exponential decay. Now, if you put uh, the temperature in this curve, nitrogen has the very highest ionization potential, the sodium, potassium they have very low ionization potential. So, that is why you always create the sodium ions and uh, the potassium ions much easily. Whereas, if you want to create N plus, the temperature has to go much higher because of the very high ionization potential, ionization energy needed to ionize the nitrogen oxygen for example, in this case. Okay. Similar the same case for 0.5 or 50 percent ionization, it can never happen for nitrogen at the temperatures of about 7000 Kelvin. So, system temperature should be increased close to 60,000 Kelvin, yes. So, then only you will can ionize, then only you can have sustained discharge, is not it? Otherwise, you will arc will extinguish, right? It is clear. So, that is how we need to heat it up to such temperatures in arc, otherwise you will never have sustained discharge. Yes, clear. So, these are the shielding gases we use nitrogen, okay, oxygen, helium, argon and each shielding gas is as its own unique ionization values potentials, right. So, obviously, the temperature of the arc will also change as a function of the shielding gases. Okay, so, the selection of shielding gas can also will also influence definitely your heat generation because of this very specific reason. reason. Okay, so, you can choose uh, whatever shielding gas you want, but obviously, you will also change the arc temperature. Okay. And before going to look at the shielding gas, so, moment you st strike an arc using a shielding gas, for example, use a helium as a shielding gas, okay. You have uh, for example, a, a simple tungsten electrode which supplies energy for initial ionization, <coughs> thermionic emission is happening, electrons are released from the cathode okay, and they are going to the, the arc column. And R column in this case, for example, you make it with uh, helium. The moment electrons reach helium regions, obviously, once the electrons which are actually emitted from the cathode gains the ionization energy required for knocking out electron from helium, the electron will be knocked out from helium, right. And then the charges, the space charges will be conducted because of the subsequent avalanche of these ionization from the tip of the cathode to anode. Then what will happen? You strike an arc, right. So, then discharge can be sustained because of the ionization process, okay. The ignition is by thermionic emission. The moment ignition happens, the electrons reach the gas medium. Upon gaining the energy E i, the ionization energy, the electrons are knocked out creating an helium ions. In this process, you create an avalanche of these reactions. The moment you have the enough charge carriers developed, you will have conduction of these charge carriers from cathode to anode. Then you strike an arc. Okay, so, the moment you strike an arc, so obviously you also melt, is not it, the anode. So, if you keep your tungsten electrode as a cathode, you will start melting the anode and if the anode is superheated, the molten anode would also vaporize, right. Then you form metal vapors, metal vapors are also gas, subsequently they will also ionize, is not it? Because ion vapor is ion gas, it would also ionize. But if you look at the ionization energy of these metal vapors, 
they are much much lower than the inert gases you use is not it. So, for example, you are welding an, an, an iron steel the iron vapors the ionization energy of iron vapor is much much lower than the shielding gas you use either helium or argon. So, the moment you create the iron vapor okay, and then the iron vapor would start subsequently ionize would carry forward this uh, discharge okay, because iron is easy to vaporize is not it. Similarly, if you are doing welding in aluminum the moment you create aluminum vapor aluminum would ionize much easily at much lower temperature than helium and argon. So, aluminum vapors can supply the electrons needed for the sustained discharge okay. So, that is what I showed in this graph. So, for example, if you have an helium and argon shielding and that is actually used for arc ignition the moment you create arc ignite an arc you start vaporizing the metal then subsequently these metal vapors would ionize and the, the ionization of metal vapor would be rate controlling okay. So, that is what when you are doing welding the, when the arc ignition is happening the arc is really hotter when the arc is ignited okay because when the at the ignition point you are ionizing the shielding gas which should be either argon or helium. Now, upon ignition once you start creating enough supply of metal vapor okay and then your metal vapor would determine the arc temperature is clear is it clear or not. So, if you look at in a real welding case the metal vapor would dictate the electrical field therefore, the temperature. So, during ignition okay your shielding gas would ionize and then arc is ignited the moment you have enough vapor is generated metal vapor is generated because of the ionization energy of the metal vapors are much lower than the, the inert gases the metal vapor would supply the electrons needed to carry forward the, the electrical field in the arc. So, that is what when you are doing a an, an, an welding of a steel or aluminum the arc temperature is much lower when you have a plasma state okay. So, by say for example, you creating with argon because argon is inert the ionization is so energy energy is so high the, the temperature of arc by pure argon will be much higher than when you are welding with the shielding gas of argon okay. You may use this gas shielding gas of an argon, but ultimately the arc is sustained by the ionization of the metal vapor okay. So, in argon uh, case when you have a shielding gas and the, the, the cath anode is not molten you have a the, the figure I showed you. So, in this case and this is the experiment was carried out with water cooled copper plate that means that you are not vaporizing copper here okay. That means that the arc here is fully created by the ionization of argon okay. So, if you are not melting the anode and then vaporizing and you can know that exactly the temperature of uh, the arc only by argon. So, that is how the temperatures are much higher okay. Suppose, if you are va start vaporizing this anode you would the temperature would drastically come down. So, the arc column the temperature will be not more than 10,000 Kelvin and envelope will be close to 5000 Kelvin in a real welding case where you are welding a metal or alloy okay because in that case the metal vapor would determine your arc temperature yes it is clear. So, the, the lesson here is so when you have gases with the very high energy and energy your arc temperature will also be high right because obviously, if you want to ionize the inert gases you need to supply more energy and that can happen only at higher temperatures compared to a gases which has low ionization energy okay. So, this is extremely important in welding case because 
that will determine your choice of the sealing gas plus the arc temperature would also be determined by the metal vapor you generate. Right? It is clear? So, that is what I want to tell you with this slide that if you look at, uh, at 5000 Kelvin, you will see that ion vapor would completely ionize. Okay? Whereas, in argon or 5000 Kelvin hardly ionized, okay, 10 power minus 7, very few atoms are ionized. So, then what is red controlling here? Metal vapor, ion vapor, is not it? It is clear? So, once ion ionizes, the ion vapor ionizes, obviously you have sustained discharge. The electrons that we need, electrons and ions, whatever it be, if the charge carriers are transported from one uh, say cathode to anode, so you strike an arc, arc is sustained. Does not matter, you need to create only with argon or helium, as long as you have a gas. In this case, it is uh, metal gas, metal vapor. Yeah, it is clear? Good. So, I just tabulated uh, the, uh, the ionization energy of various elements. And if you, if you look at it, obviously helium, the electron volt is the maximum 24.6. And if you look at the helium is 24.6, the argon, okay, we have argon here, yes, 50.8. And if you look at the metals that are very low, copper for example, 7.7, .7, okay, one third of uh, helium, close to one third. Right, and if you look at uh, the aluminium, it's much lower as well. So therefore, when you have metal vapor, so obviously you can ionize them easily at lower temperatures. Yes, it's clear. So the fundamentals of choosing a sealing gas is derived from these physics. Okay, it is not like randomly you can go and okay, I will, I will weld with argon or helium. Okay. Because you have argon, you can't just like that go and choose argon and weld. Because your uh, the arc temperature would also determine by the ionization. Okay, so the the, the principles of cho choosing sealing gas is all determined by the physics governed in this sustained dis uh, discharge. Okay, similarly, if you mix it with the two gases, obviously that will also affect the temperature of the arc because the ionization will be changed. Right, so clear. So apart from the the atomic ionization, sometimes you may also have a, a diatomic gases or molecular gases. Okay, that also you can use sometimes during welding, isn't it? For example, uh, O two or N two or even CO two, for example. Okay, sometimes you also use diatomic hydrogen, hydrogen molecule. So then if you use such gases, the first reaction that would happen is not the ionization, but the dissociation, right? So dissociation is nothing but, again, when the molecular gases are used and they first dissociate before even being ionized. So they would first dissociate in our column. Again, the heat is supplied. Unless you supply heat, you we would not give the energy for dissociation. Okay, so ED is a dissociation energy. It's nothing but the same as ionization. When a, when a, when a, by, the, uh, a molecular gas is supplied energy, it becomes an atomic gas. So when diatomic gas becomes an atomic gas. Okay, so, CO2 becomes, when CO2 dissociates, what will happen? C plus 2 C plus 2 Really? It will be carbon monoxide and oxygen. Okay, so, you create an, an atomic carbon monoxide okay, and then an oxygen atom. Subsequently, this carbon monoxide and oxygen atom would ionize. Okay? 
So again the ionization it is also not a single step process whether you have a uh, atomic gas or diatomic gas, diatomic gas first will disintegrate into an atomic gas and then the ionization would progress in a multi stage process. Okay. So, first reaction obviously, so suppose the graph shows the density, number density of various ions you have as a function of temperature. Okay. So, for example, this graph, this line shows the number density of argon atoms as a function of temperature. Okay. So, upon reaching sufficient temperature, then the ionization, the first ionization, basic ionization is to create argon plus. Okay, so, the argon plus will be created and in this process you also create an electron. Okay, so, argon plus will create, but if temperature is increased and subsequently the argon plus would also subsequently further ionize into argon 2 plus okay. and then argon 3 plus. Okay. Subsequently, once all the electrons are stripped off, it will leave with an empty a shell. Okay, so, this process would be continuing until the atom is completely stripped off of the electrons, right? It is clear. So, it is consumed by the process, but energy is balanced. Okay. So, whatever energy you supply, it is also gained somewhere, right? And of, of course, they will also collide, mutual collision can lead to generation of subsequently an enormous amount of heat. And this process would continue by this avalanche of reactions of ionization, collisions and generation of heat and heat is used to ionize again and then again collision to generate heat. So, it, the chain reaction would continue until all the electrons are completely stripped off. So, if you supply, if the supply of gas is stopped, what will happen then? You do not have any more gas atoms to ionize. So, you cannot strike an arc, right. So, shielding gas if it is stopped, you turn the turn off the bottle, what will happen to the arc? Arc extinguishes because it is all consumed, right, because you ionized the gas in such an extent that all the electrons are all completely stripped off and it is extremely rapid process, okay. So, you need to supply continuously the shielding gas. Okay. So, if you stop it then the arc will not be stable and subsequently arc would also extinguish. In, a, in an atmospheric uh, conditions you may continue because you still further have the, the gas atoms in the atmospheric conditions, but then it is not enough for sustained discharge unless you supply the shielding gas continuously. Yes, it is clear? Yeah. Uh, why is it the increasing temperature, there is a decrease in particle density in case of argon? In case of argon? So yeah, argon is converted into argon plus, argon 2 plus, argon 3 plus. Also, this is the neutral argon atom. Okay. So, electron density is increasing and upon this temperature, for example, argon plus goes down because you start, a, you start to create yeah. argon 2 plus. Upon this temperature, this will also come down because you start creating argon 3 plus. Yeah. The same thing is also applicable if you have a diatomic gas. Okay. So, diatomic gas, the first reaction is dissociation. Okay, dissociation is nothing but when you have an N2 nitrogen, it should first become N. Okay, but then the atomic gas, once it becomes atomized, the uh, diatomic gas once it becomes atomized, then it will start ionize. So N becomes N plus, subsequently N2 plus and N3 plus, and it can go up to so N plus, and the, yeah, sometimes it can also be N2 plus, but it's very rare. Okay, so, the first reaction should happen is the dissociation of N, this is only N2 becomes N okay. and once it becomes N obviously the electrons would generate 
by ionizing the n and becomes n plus and n 2 plus and n 3 plus. Okay. So, the dissociation can also be calculated the fraction dissociation the same as you calculate a degree of ionization. The only difference here is 2 times there each ionization process gives 1 electron whereas, in this case the fraction gives 2 products. Okay. So, when the N 2 dissociates it becomes 2 n. So, you put 2 over there at the same saga equation, okay, Magnus saga equation, which can also be used. One thing is E d is not an ionization energy, in this case is dissociation energy. Again, it is all related to temperature, same by the saga equation, right. So, this is again it will follow the same curve of ionization. Yes, clear? The E d. So, once you know that you know temperature, obviously, you know by calculating E d, by E d is a material parameter, gas parameter, you can calculate what is the fraction dissociated. And this is important equation in arcs perspective because the heat conduction by this process dissociation is, is very effective. So, in subsequent slides we will when we calculate the heat, the heat transfer by conduction this equation is very important okay, because the dissociation and subsequently the ionization of dissociation gas okay, would have the heat conducted from one point to other point. Okay. So, when you look at the conduction heat conduction and this phenomena the dissociation is extremely critical. Okay. So, that is why when you use a, a diatomic gas as a shielding gas for example, N 2 or CO 2 the arc temperature is much lower compared to when you use atomic gas. Why? Because you need to supply energy for this process. This again is endothermic reaction. Okay. So, when you use carbon dioxide as a shielding gas the heat generated in the arc is much lower okay. and it is because dissociation also needs energy and sometimes dissociation can also conduct heat effectively from one point to other point. Okay. So, we will look at in subsequent classes how it actually going to affect the temperature distribution of an arc. So, now you can assume that because the dissociation is endothermic obviously sorry the heat in the arc it is also contained or reduced. So, when you use more diatomic CO2 carbon dioxide shielding the arc temperature can decrease significantly. Okay. So, that is what when you want to control the heat input we are uh, when you are welding some cases we do not use a pure atomic gas we will use argon plus CO2. Okay. So, we use an additional diatomic gas so that we can control or we can reduce the heat. Okay. It is not only by this process, but it is also effective conduction. Okay. It is clear? It is clear or not? Okay. This is very basic, right? So, again the same principle applies to the dissociation fraction as well. So, obviously, N 2 has a very high dissociation energy, okay. whereas CO 2 has very low dissociation energy. So, obviously, when you use CO 2 what will happen? It can be dissociated at low temperature and in ionization of carbon monoxide as well much lower than atomic nitrogen. That means, that when you use CO 2 the arc temperature will be much lower. Right? clear? Okay. The same principle goes when, when you use CO2 and argon. Argon is atomic gas, ionization is very high, the arc temperature will be very, very high. Whereas, CO2 can be dissociated at lower temperature and ionized at lower temperature. Obviously, the system temperature can be lower. Right? It's clear? Good. So, some of the, the, the table you can note it down. 
So nitrogen has dissociation energy of 9.76, CO2 4.3 and hydrogen 4.48. So sometimes you know, to weld an austenitic stainless steel we also use hydrogen. So hydrogen cannot be used for ferritic steels, right? What will happen then? We will have an hydrogen diffusion. Okay. So some cases we can use hydrogen to control the, the diatomic gases are mixed with atomic gases during welding to control the heat. Okay, we can balance it. If you use a pure helium, the heat is enormous okay, because helium can be ionized at the temperatures of 15,000 Kelvin. Okay, the NOx temperature is enormous. Okay, so, you mix some CO2 with that so that the entire system temperature can be decreased. We can use CO2 as well, but then uh, the arc stability, we will see in subsequent classes why pure CO2, pure CO2 is you are using it already. So when you use uh, flux code arc welding, self sealed what do you mean by self sealed Yeah, so flux burns generates CO2, okay, so these are all subsequent chapters, okay. So you can also use pure CO2, but the arc stability may not be good because of uh, various reaction I am going to show you in the conduction convection radiation okay it's clear the arc temperature is affected by the presence of diatomic gases because of the dissociation phenomena okay and we'll also see in subsequent slides how the heat is conducted from the one place to other place by conduction convection and radiation yes good so this is clear, so we completely strip off the electrons from the, uh, the, the atomic poisons and then until uh, you consume the, the entire gas, the reaction would continue. And then you need to supply the fresh gas to make it sustained, yes, it is clear, good. <coughs> 